Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Our webinar today is Introducing Electronic Quality of Life Assessments in Hospital Palliative Care. Uh, before we start, I have a few things to go over in terms of network news and competitions in process. Um, um, for our question and answer session today, we hope that you will submit your questions during the presentation and we will get to as many as possible. And Perry Kim, our manager of research, will, will host the Q&A session today. There are some videos in today's webinars, so you might see a little bit of hesitation, but bear with us. I think they add value to the presentation. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, there will be a pop-up screen at the end of the webinar, and hopefully you will um, be able to fill in to give us some feedback both on the presenters and on the CFN webinar and how we can improve the series. Um, today's uh, video plus the PowerPoints will be put up within the next 48 hours, normally earlier, but just to be on the safe side, uh, if you want to return in 48 hours, they should be up. There are three webinars that uh, we would love that if all of you would uh, register for. Uh, there's one on December 6th, and that's exploring the preferences of older Canadians living with frailty for aspects of inpatient care. And on January 10th, on your return from the break, you'll find uh, identifying older patients at risk of poor outcomes after joint replacement surgery. And again, we have one Wednesday, January 24th, on reducing post-discharge potentially inappropriate medications amongst the elderly. Um, we have a whole host of webinars posted on our website and you can register at any time. So just to give an update on, on our competitions, we did have the 2017 Catalyst Grant Competition, which was addressing polypharmacy and medication issues in older Canadians living with frailty. That competition is now closed. So thank you for all of those uh, applicants who submitted. The reviews are in process and the results for that will likely be uh, late March, early April. We have, have a 2017 Knowledge Translation Grant competition um, in process. It's, um, it will be announced in the next few weeks, so stay tuned for that. We had some excellent submissions and really hard to choose just a few. Um, we also have some new funding opportunities coming out, one for research. We have a competition based on the results of our Canadian Frailty Priority Setting Partnership, and it will be launched in December. And we are seeking some partner organizations interested in co-funding, so if anybody has some suggestions or if anybody's interested, please contact us. And stay tuned for the launch uh, email and uh, website update uh, for more details. We also have the Interdisciplinary Fellowship uh, Program and the Summer Student for 2018. That will be launched in December. So again, watch the uh, um, website and we will be sending out a mass email. And please communicate as far as wide as you can. Uh, we do have uh, a needs assessment, an HQP needs assessment that completed. So it is in uh, analysis, looking at how we would change our program going forward. Some of the details won't be available until the beginning of the year. And some of the changes that look like they will be uh, added to our program is more on citizen engagement and how to do it properly and effectively in our target population. So without further ado, I will start with an introduction to our presenters today. Today we have Rick Zawatsky. He's the professor at Trinity Western University and he holds a CRC in person centered outcomes at Trinity Western University. He's the lead on the patient reported outcomes at the Center for Health Evaluation and Outcome Sciences at Providence Healthcare in BC. We also have Marian Krasnick and she's uh, coming from us from Scotland today, she's a medical anthropologist interested in all aspects of death, dying, and institutionalized end of care. Lord Kelvin Adam Smith Fellow in the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies with the End of Life Studies Group at the University of Glasgow. 
And she is also a former CFN Interdisciplinary Fellow. So I think, Rick, you're starting today. So over to you, and hopefully uh, your um, video will work and all will go smoothly. Wonderful. Um, I just want to ch check which screen is showing. Great. Good. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, I uh, very much look forward to sharing with you um, this work on, on quality of life assessments in hospital-based palliative care and introducing a micro-meso-macro framework to that. Um, I'm actually situated at St. Paul's Hospital right now, and they just started construction outside of my window. So I am hoping that's not too loud. <laughs> Um, but I will proceed and uh, let me know if there's a problem with the sound. Um, so we've already been introduced and here are our pictures. And uh, Marion, uh, would you just like to let your voice be heard? Hi, everybody. Um, I have no construction here. <laughs> good. So Loud there's my voice test. <laughs> Very good. And um, the Marion will be doing the second half of the presentation, and I'll be doing the uh, first half. And we'll, we're we're planning to have a discussion after the presentation. We think it will take about 40 minutes. Um, um, we do wish to declare that the the research that we're going to be presenting on is in partnership with uh, two companies called Cam. Ambient Business Services and Integrate Research and Development. They're both health information uh, technology companies, um, but those companies, uh, we have no vested interests, no fi financial interests in those companies at all. Uh, the studies are funded through federal competitive operating grants, including the Canadian Institutes for Health Research and, of course, the Canadian Frailty Network. Um, so we'll briefly uh, provide an introduction to quality of life assessments and the quality of life assessment and pr uh, practice support system initiative. And then we're going to share uh, results from two studies funded by the Canadian Frailty Network. One is on integrating uh, a quality of life assessment and practice support system in palliative care, hospital-based palliative care. Um, and the other one is on the relational use of such a system uh, by a palliative outreach uh, consult team. And then we'll conclude with a brief discussion. So just briefly, um, the um, uh, sorry about that. So just briefly, um, we're, we're, our, all our work is focused on trying to enhance what we refer to as person-centered care, which seeks to place patients and family caregivers as persons at the forefront of health care, as persons who are both suffering because of a medical condition, but also capable in participating in their own care. Um, a key characteristic of person-centered care is to enable patients and families to tell their stories and sharing about their distress and their well-being and to share this information with all people who influence their care. Traditionally, performance indicators and clinical outcomes have been used to inform person-centered care. So performance indicators are things like wait times, um, uh, 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 admission rates, and so on, and clinical outcomes we're all quite familiar with. Um, but the perspective of patients and fa family caregivers have not always been so visible in our health information systems. Healthcare providers need to understand healthcare experiences and outcomes of patients from their point of view. And there's also a need to pay attention to the experiences and outcomes of family caregivers. In summary, the imperative of person-centered care requires that the full range of healthcare experiences and outcomes relevant to the quality of life of patients and their family caregivers is routinely assessed and integrated at all levels of health services decision-making. Or as pointed out by Gerties, our aim should be to find out what each patient wants, needs, and experiences in our healthcare system. Um, and so we propose to do that through the use of, of quality of life assessments, what we're referring to as quality of life assessments. And this is not a new idea. Quality of life assessments have been a long, around for a very long time. The first studies were being done in the, in the 1970s already. But briefly, we refer to quality of life assessments as uh, 
pertaining to the routine and systematic assessment of patient and family caregiver and experience and outcome comes through the use of standardized instruments, which we refer to as PROMs and PREMs, or patient reported outcome measures and patient reported experience measures, and similarly measures for family caregivers. Taken together, PROMs and PREMs comprise comprise what we refer to as the initial stage of a quality of life assessment. In other words, we define quality of life assessments as involving the use of these instruments to facilitate routine monitoring of fluctuations in people's quality of life, including their health outcomes and their experiences with healthcare. It is important, however, that the use of these tools is not just a starting point for enhancing per it is just a starting point for enhancing person centered care and shared decision making. So briefly, a patient reported outcome measure, and I'll go to the next slide, pertains to instruments that ask people to reflect inwardly on how they are doing. There's many tools available for patients and family caregivers. Here's an example of a tool um, developed by Robin Cohen, and we recently published it, a revised version of it in palliative medicine that asks patients to reflect on aspects of their quality of life, including their physical, psychological, existential, and relational well-being. They're asked to respond to a series of 14 questions on uh, that uh, using rating scale type of uh, response options and, and the results are then summarized in terms of these domains. A similar tool is also available for family caregivers. In addition to PROMs, uh, PREMs ask people to think, consider, look outwardly and consider how they are doing um, uh, based on the care that they are receiving. So it asks people to consider um, whether, the care, the, whether the relationships with their care providers are what they need to be, whether they are involved in decision making and which they wish in, to the extent they wish to be involved in decision making, whether they receive the information they need, how they're involved in illness management, their communication, respect, dignity, feeling of peace, and so on. So it's all about uh, their experiences with their care provided. And one uh, instrument that's uh, increasingly used in end-of-life or palliative care is the Can Help uh, instrument, the Canadian Healthcare Evaluation Project. And here is just an overview of, of that instrument, uh, of the, the short form of that instrument. Um, there's a longer version and there's also a version for family caregivers. There are many other instruments available. Some of the most common ones used in palliative care include uh, the, the ESAS or the Edmonton Symptom Assessment Scale, which consists of 11 questions for measuring symptoms and well-being, and it focuses on the current state. Uh, another one uh, that focuses on family caregivers is a quality of life um, threatening illness family caregiver version uh, instruments by Robin Cohen and it measures a quality of life domain such as environment, patients conditions, the caregiver's own well-being and outlook and quality of care relationships and financial considerations. So jointly, we refer to the use of, of these instruments, these PROMs and PREMs, as, per, as the beginning point of a quality of life assessment. There's been tons of research done on this, this type of idea. It's not a new idea. Uh, the first randomized controlled trial was already in the 1970s, and we've had uh, many randomized controlled controlled trials and systematic reviews since. Here on this slide, I show two systematic reviews that have been recently conducted, focusing specifically on the palliative care context. But these tools have been used in many other contexts. Overall, the tools have potential to make patients and family caregivers concerns uh, more visible um, regarding their quality of, the, uh, of life. They also have the ability to raise awareness of problems that may otherwise not have been noticed or identified. And they provide permission to have discussions about problems that, that may otherwise um, not, not have been uh, part of an assessment. They can lead to improved clinician and patient communication. Uh, studies have also shown results in terms of improved care plans and improved collaborations amongst healthcare professionals, especially professionals from different disciplines. 
So the research is actually relatively compelling. Um, of course, results are always mixed, but there's great potential for the use of these tools. However, despite these benefits, they are actually not widely used um, in home or, or, or hospital <laughs> care for older adults who have life-limiting illness. And so we've been uh, doing research over the past years to try to address that gap, which we refer to as the quality of life assessment and practice support system initiative. Uh, this initiative consists of, of an innovation community that is, uh, gui that is guiding a, a series of studies um, focused on the use of a quality of life assessment and practice support system. Uh, briefly, we refer to such a system as an innovative, integrated, person-centered e-health information system that is specifically designed to facilitate the use of quality of life assessment instruments, such as PROMS or PREMS, at point of care that can provide instantaneous feedback with information about scores, scores imputation, interpretation, change over time and targets for improvement. And you could see in, in the figure here uh, uh, that, that you can get graphs on, on, these different on these different assessments and evaluate people's change over time. And they also have capacity to be integrated with other health information systems. The use of such a system is what we refer to as, a, as the QPSS intervention. And very briefly, this involves uh, three steps. The first step is to obtain patients and family caregivers appraisals of their quality of life and care experiences. So patients and family caregivers are invited to complete a series of questions. That can be done via an interview. That could be done using a tablet. It can be done independently online, such as when they're at home. In a hospital based context, we have usually done this using a tablet device uh, with or without a healthcare provider pre present. Uh, the second ste step then involves a healthcare provider reviewing that information um, uh, as part of their quality of life assessment. And the third step then involves the response, where the goal is to enhance person-centered care, share decision-making on in continuity of care. And examples of possible actions include ongoing assessments, of course, uh, because the, the, the tools only provide a rating scale, and so a more in-depth assessment is uh, typically desired, but at least they will highlight the areas that are in need of further assessment. Um, and um, uh, other actions include referral to, to other services um, and, and, include, and reviews of, um, of, of this information in patient-centered care planning and decision-making, such as during rounds, for instance. We have been studied as studying the use of this system um, that we refer to as a complex intervention, as I mentioned, uh, within a range of sectors of care. Our ultimate goal is to promote the use or to study the use across sectors of care, including primary care, tertiary care, outpatient care, and consult teams. And we have studies that, that intersect with each one of those sectors of care, with the ultimate goals of enhancing person-centered care, shared decision-making, and continuity of care. And here is a, 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 an overview of the studies um, that we have been doing. But briefly today, we're going to report on the results of two projects. One focuses on the integration of a QPSS in a multidisciplinary palliative care unit in the hospital. And the second project focuses on the relation, re relational use of the system by palliative outcome team nurses. So I'll say a few things about the first project. Um, the project had a, had a range of research questions, but the question that we're focusing on today is how do palliative care clinicians relate to different healthcare system priorities when integrating PROMs and PREMs into their care? And this is informed uh, by the recognition that the use of these tools um, uh, comes with um, different priorities and different uh, coming from different stakeholders. We're introducing a macro, micro, meso, micro framework as a means of um, drawing attention to these different priorities at different levels of decision making. So the earlier slide about the impact of the use of these tools at points of care refers to the micro uh, level of decision making, where the focus is 
is on enhanced person-centered care at the individual level and where the results are used then for um, shared decision making enhanced continuity of care through integration into practice but the tools also are used uh, to address priorities at the mesomec level level which have to do with quality improvement and organizational types of consideration uh, such as identifying gaps in services decisions about different types of treatments and cost effectiveness uh, within the organization and of course there's increased interest especially recently regarding the use of this type of information at the macro level uh, for accountability purposes for health policy at regional provincial and la national levels where the societal focus is on population health and decisions about cost equity and health policy um, te technically the tools have capacity to uh, provide information at each of these levels of decision making but of course the priorities are very different and uh, that's what this project was focusing on how do clinician make sense clinicians make sense of these different priorities in a point of care um, so uh, our research is, is uh, uh, all our studies are conducted in the form of what we refer to as an integrated knowledge translation approach or an implementation science type of approach to conducting research, where the first stage then involves working with each of the clinical teams in figuring out, well, what is the problem in your local context and how do we adapt what we know to your local context and what are the barriers and facilitators in your local context and how do we use the knowledge that we have uh, to address those barriers or facilitators and how do we then adapt the interventions which is the implementation of a QPSS within that particular set practice setting how do we adapt and design a protocol around that that works in this particular setting so that's all to do with stage one stage two then focuses more on use and evaluation um, or studies involve uh, randomized trials and evaluation of outcomes cost effectiveness analysis and uh, qualitative evaluation of implementation and then the third stage focuses on sustainability our focus today is really on stage one of, of this entire process so in the first study that, that I'm describing right now, um, um, I'm going to be talking about the results um, pertaining to a palliative care unit at a, in an urban, suburban acute care hospital in, in British Columbia. It's a 10 pay, a bed palliative care unit with an interdisciplinary team. Um, we collected data over, uh, over two years via five focus groups with clinicians on user-centered design and implementation considerations, so implementation pertaining to the use of a QPSS, and we conducted 25 in-person interviews with clinicians um, on perspectives about PROMS and PREMS and use in practice. Um, the study, of course, also involves uh, interviews and data collection from patients and family caregivers, um, but for this particular presentation, we are focusing on the, the clinician perspective, uh, uh, specifically uh, on the question of uh, these different healthcare priorities. Um, you could see our samples here. We had a total of 25 clinicians with a range of age, a range of, uh, of experience levels from one to 26 years, uh, mostly female um, and uh, mostly nurses, but we also had medical doctors and some other professionals like social worker, spiritual care provider, and, and so on. So briefly, um, with respect to the challenge of, of um, um, uh, of the different um, uh, care priorities across macro, meso and micro levels of decision making, um, we've conducted an analysis that and organized the results in terms of three overarching patterns based on uh, our analysis of the qualitative focus groups and interviews. Um, and those patterns could be summarized as follows. One ha is kind of the increasing growing recognition of tensions. Uh, uh, and so one of the tensions had to do with, well, to what extent are these, use, these tools mandated to be used and to what extent, what are the benefits of discretionary use? And there was a tension there and a growing recognition of that. Um, the other um, tension has to do with standardization and quantification. Uh, one's um, recognition 
recognition that we do need some degree of standardization and quantification uh, to inform our practice. Uh, but on the other hand, to what extent does that uh, constrain our ability to provide person-centered care, constrain or enable, I should say. Um, and then, then there's questions around scope of practice. Is quality of life everyone's concern or is quality of life the domain of particular healthcare providers? So I'll briefly say a few things about these things. Um, one in terms of benefits of mandated use. Um, the team's, uh, team was initially extremely enthusiastic about the project um, and using and the use of these types of tools. And they recognized the different macro, meso, and micro level types of priorities in enhancing palliative care services, informing clinical practice and palliative uh, quality improvements, and enhancing person-centered care of both per patients and family caregivers. But as, as, as the project moved Along, they also uh, became increasingly um, uh, cognizant of considerations uh, obtaining the complexities of meso and macro level uh, types of priorities. Um, um, meso and micro level types of priorities. And they include kind of challenges of workflow integration. How do we integrate this into our workflow and with integrated within our clinical teams? And how do we navigate these competing priorities? Some priorities which focus on the, on the individual person and the other priorities which really focus on priorities of the healthcare provider and the healthcare system overall. Um, the next uh, uh, tension had to do with standardization and quantification. Of course, clinicians are very use, used to using standardized information. Our lab results and so on all are, pre, all are reported in standardized format. Um, and so, um, so the idea of, of, of using a tool to get some standardized information about people's quality of life as, uh, concerns um, came quite naturally initially initially and the clinicians we re reference positive considerations regarding uh, the potential for doing so. They also acknowledge the ability to generate data for administration and policy purposes. But then um, there was also a tension regarding the ability to integrate this type of standardized approach to assessment to uh, the priorities of person-centered care. Uh, um, and some clinicians were more comfortable with that and others were less comfortable with that. Um, some had concerns about the negative, uh, perceived negative impact on therapeutic relationships, um, but others on the other hand saw the tools as actually really facilitating therapeutic relationships. And Marion is going to talk about that some more. Uh, just briefly, here is a result from a quote from a clinician. I do think that in nursing, in general, that we tend to rely too much on tools and protocols and not enough on personal communication and just quality assessments. And in my heart, I think although these are validated tools, I think they're validated under certain conditions. I think that we use, for example, the ESAR in a way that is not validated, for instance, and accreditation would be one reason. I don't think that any tool should be something that's mandatory thing. And I think actually a lot of these tools are robbing nursing of the art of nursing. I can explore these things in a conversation that is far less clinical, probably more inviting to the person. Although at times I think probably they would like to be more, uh, more anonymous of just interacting with a piece of paper or a tablet. So you could really see the tension here that the nurse is, is struggling with. Um, and, and also recognizing the, that um, patients might also appreciate some anonymity in first kind of providing their information in a way that is not mediated by an, uh, an assessment by an individual nurse. And then finally, the scope of practice tensions pertaining to um, whether quality of life is everyone's concern or whether it's in the do domain of particular healthcare providers uh, or professions. And that tension worked out as well, especially in the hospital setting. Um, uh, of course, from a holistic practice point of view, um, we would view quality of life of every, as, as every healthcare pr practic practitioner's concern. Certainly, uh, most practitioners have been trained uh, to consider all dimensions of well-being as highly regarded in palliative care. So we were somewhat, somewhat surprised to see this being uh, questioned within a palliative care context, and yet it did come out in our interviews. And so um, where some clinicians were viewing quality of life as outside of their scope of practice, and um, 
and uh, and so this thus questioning the use of of these type of instruments here is an example of one clinician who took that particular view i th think it should be done maybe by either social worker or spiritual care coordinator people that can sit down and talk about that because i would feel that i'm not compassionate enough Sometimes you ask one patient or one family member one question that requires a yes or no answer, and it would go into like 10 minutes conversation, which also pushes you back from what's waiting for you out there. The bells are ringing and stuff. I cannot relax in knowing that my other people are having pain. I just write or not put myself into those shoes that they ask the question, and then I can't fulfill that. So I'd write or not even initiate that conversation, because I know if I do, and maybe it's not the best practice, but I feel if I start, I need to finish, and I can't, and then I feel really bad. When I leave, I have to put that smell back on and go to the next room and pretend that nothing uh, happened in the next room. So this is this quote really articulates this this tension um, and and uh, almost communicates a, a sense of guilt and um, and sorrow as to not being able to uh, attend to the full range of quality of life concerns of of, of the patients. So that's kind of a summary of, of, uh, of how uh, healthcare providers are engaging um, uh, the use of these types of tools in a palliative care uh, hospital-based context. And so I'll turn it over to you, Marion, to discuss your project. Great, thanks, Rick. And that was uh, really well done with the uh, distractions of the construction there. Um, so as I was introduced, my name is Marion, and this was, um, a project that was in part funded by uh, the CFN and so what it was is a continuation of the larger project uh, that Rick is talking about this overall initiative and really what this study focused on was um, palliative nurse consultants uh, trialing the QPSS with uh, older hospitalized patients and really the primary aim was to um, better understand the consultants and the patients' experiences and perspectives of the QPSS. And um, it was, uh, again, a large tertiary acute hospital in an urban uh, setting. Next. Rick, can I get you to, oh, there we go. Thanks, sorry, it's, um, being in uh, different, continent makes the changing of slides a little challenging. So with the methods and sample, um, it was a, a user-centered design. There was these three focus groups at the beginning, middle, and end uh, that included the entire pocket team, and they chose three of the uh, assessments that Rick introduced previously. Um, next. So although the whole pocket team was involved, it primarily involved the two uh, clinical nurse specialists within the palliative outreach consult team. And both of the nurses had uh, quite a extensive range of experience. They both had more than 10 years of palliative specific experience. They're both female and they used uh, the QPSS with 20 consenting older adult patients. Now uh, they approached 27 patients that met inclusion criteria. Uh, seven patients declined to participate, and so the overall response rate was 78%, which was we found surprisingly high because the whole goal of this really was just to give the uh, the QPSS to the consult nurses, and, and they were interested for themselves seeing how it could be integrated uh, into a really high acute, high symptomatic population. So here you get some of the patient demographics. The average age was 66, most were male, um, educational status was varied. And uh, one of the most interesting things for us was that um, almost two thirds of the population that they were dealing with were not cancer patients. Uh, it was COPD, heart failure, renal failure, cirrhosis. So that was uh, an interesting finding. And the self-reported length of diagnosis was approximately an average of four years. So most of the patients they were working with had um, had been living with the illness for some time. So the analytic approach, uh, perhaps not as a surprise given that I'm an anthropologist, it, uh, evaluation of the, the implementation was grounded in ethnographic research and approach, which basically is embedding uh, 
into the, the clinical team or the, the research setting. And so I spent 50 hours over the nine weeks as well as engaging in multiple interviews with the pocket team, the nurses, and we ideally wanted more uh, interviews with patients, but given how acute um, the context was of their care and their illness, that was one of the challenges. And thematic analysis of the results uh, was informed by theoretical perspectives in the social sciences, primarily in medical anthropology and the so, uh, science and technology studies. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more uh, near the end about why I think that that's an important inclusion. Next. So the overall project, oh, thanks, sorry. Uh, the uh, overall uh, implementation was quite short, it's nine weeks. And as I said, the, the num they did 47 administrations of using PSS with 20 patients. And one of the concerns that Rick um, had touched on previously is about the length of time of using these instruments. And uh, again, one of the most interesting findings was that uh, it really took very little time. You can see here the time to complete in the 75% tile is that for the 75% of the population, uh, the use didn't take more than, took less than three minutes for the ESAS, took five minutes for the MQAL because it has more questions, and then the CAN help, which is uh, a fairly substantive assessment was about 12 minutes. And this is one of the nurses who participated in, and, and she has a good overview of the timing. So I'm just gonna run this clip here. Oh. conversation and it gave I think him and myself a lot of meaning and when I look back on it it took less than 15 minutes and I found that really surprising because both for me and I can't I don't know for him for sure but it certainly felt like much longer and you think wow you know 15 minutes to have a really big impact um, is is well worth it. That was by far the longest interaction that I had. Most of them were, I would say, less than five minutes. Um, always felt longer, but it was very uh, short, uh, but meaningful. So for me, as an uh, interdisciplinary social science, um, person, one of the things that I'm most interested in is how, how things actually happen on the ground, not just what we think should happen. Uh, and so when I was uh, conducting this research and, and embedded with the clinicians, one of the things that was the most surprising was that um, one of the benefits of using uh, patient-reported outcome uh, measures has traditionally been that they are a way of directly reporting the patient experience without interpretation, so without any kind of mediation by the clinician or any other party. And here in this setting, what uh, we found was that the nurses most often assisted patients in using it, and both the patients and the nurses expressed a clear preference for this relational rather than independent use. And so this was pretty diverse what it could look like. Um, often the nurse would sit or stand close to the patient's bed and, and hold the QPSS so that the patient could see or touch the face of the tablet, uh, helping verbally review instructions and assessment scales, uh, and then asking each question and pausing for patient response, which was then either entered by the nurse or the patient. There were times where the patients independently used the QPSS while the nurse either stayed in the room or returned after a short period of time. And I mean, on one level, this sounds maybe um, relatively banal, but looking in detail at how technologies are incorporated in actual clinical settings has been one of the challenges, not just for PROMS and PREMS, but in many ways for a lot of studies around uh, incorporating technologies into the into routine care. And so through this relational practice, um, both nurses and the patients talked about three real benefits of, of doing it this way relationally. Um, it was able to facilitate relevant conversations. It wasn't just uh, entering data into the uh, QPSS, there was conversations 
It's about the quality of life and experiences of care. And, and this promoted a sense of uh, therapeutic relations being built. And, and, and through that trust, there was at times this very rapid co-production of new knowledge about quality of life and care experiences. And by co-production of new knowledge, what I mean is that knowledge that not necessarily the patient had a full understanding even for themselves previous to using QPSS. Next. So again, um, the nurse here is just going to speak much more eloquently than I can about the benefits. Patients that I used the QPSS with several times. Um, he was quite a gregarious, like outgoing gentleman, and he was very keen to, to participate and, and talk with us. And he, you know, he found the process, I think, very therapeutic and was articulate enough to be able to, like, tell us that, you know, like he said, you know, this has been really good for me to reflect on some of this stuff as well. Um, and, you know, I think he really appreciated that we were able to raise some of these things and give him the opportunity to, to think about it. And as we, you know, we met with him several times and went through it several times. And, you know, it really gave me a great benefit. Oh, okay. Um, so unfortunately, the uh, the videos are not uh, perfect, and I know that uh, the clinician there, uh, when I talk to her, will <laughs> she's she is much more um, eloquent than the lag in the video shows. So the but the preference for relational use uh, was with the patient. You know, one of the quotes here is that. It's bringing things to the surface that maybe I need to examine. It helps me understand where I'm at. And I think that's important when you're dealing with something like I'm dealing with. I preferred both of us sort of sitting together and doing it together. It made more for more communication and a little extra discussion. It created a bond. Um, and so that really speaks to from the patient perspective about the actual act of um, not just the QPSS, but what the QPSS PSS was able to do as a relational thing. And the same with the nurse saying, uh, this is the other nurse who was working on the project. It just really connected us uh, to the patients. And we got so much more information and therapeutic information where I was like, oh, you have shared with me some feelings that you haven't even really maybe thought of yourself. You get a lot of information about what someone is thinking and feeling as a human being. And then also all of the clinical stuff about symptoms. And I think that last little bit is particularly important because one of the things is that uh, I want to highlight is it wasn't just about the, the kind of psychosocial component, though that clearly was one of the fundamental aspects about their um, desire and interest in using it, but also because they did it in context of also gathering information about clinical symptoms. Uh, so next. I think we're just going to skip this one. Oh, one more. And so one of the interesting, uh, one of the many interesting things about the uh, project was that the clinicians had decided that given that this was um, a first stage of integrating it into their practice, that they wanted to see themselves uh, organically how the, the data could be used, the outcome of uh, the numerical data. And so they found that primarily these were the four ways that um, they used it. They engaged uh, each time with on-the-spot reviews with patients, but they also discussed the result with other uh, pocket team members, uh, as well as recording notable outcomes in the patient's chart. And at times, they were able to have on-the-spot discussions with a member of the primary care team, um, particularly in those kinds of hallway, informal hallway discussions that happen all the time in hospitals. And that was a particularly interesting outcome to see how they transferred that information to the larger care settings. Next. So the, the time that I spent in observation as well as doing interviews and, and, and the focus group data, when we took a look at all of it, uh, we found that it indicated that the palliative nurse consultants and their patients experienced significant collective benefits to the process of care 
when using the QPSS. And, and notably, the thing was that many of these benefits appear to emerge out of this relational use that I'm highlighting. And so this preferred style of use appeared to accelerate development of a, of a shared therapeutic space for, for really candid exploration of quality of life and care experiences. And as I was highlighting at times, this resulted in a, a co-production of new understandings about these experiences, including understandings that were shared beyond that uh, dyadic relationship of the, the nurse and the patients. Uh, the slide or the video that I skipped over was uh, a discussion about how uh, in one instance the, it was used to better uh, create discharge planning for one of the patients that was using it. Um, so, so along with those three benefits that I, I have been um, speaking about, about facilitating relevant conversations and, and promoting therapeutic relationship building in this, this new knowledge production, some of the other things the nurses picked up on that they felt was important was that they felt that it helped them to increase the visibility of quality of life and experience of care issues of their patients within this institutional space that you know, we all are aware that conventionally, conventionally really has limited capacity to focus on these issues. And they also, the nurses also felt that patients were more aware that their quality of life concerns were relevant to, to both to the, the clinicians and to their overall hospital care. And so due to these therapeutic and, and clinical benefits, both of the nurses reported quite, uh, quite, a bit of incorporating some of the actual standardized questions from the assessments into routine verbal interactions with non-participating patients. And uh, last but not least, both nurses spoke quite at length about how using the QPSS actually supported their development as care providers because it enabled them to better understand what um, the needs were of their patients and how to be with their patients patients, even at times if there's difficult topics that came up. So collectively, these results suggest that uh, even though it was a very small study, that using uh, a QPSS as part of a routine care really can enhance practices consistent uh, with person-centered care. Next. So what I'm going to do is, uh, before I uh, turn it back to Rick, just very quickly, um, one of my biggest interests is in using social science theory, theorizing to help uh, policy development and clinical practice. And in, in problems and problems research, there's been a call for new analytical approaches to, to best know how to incorporate them into, into routine care. And so as an anthropologist, I have borrowed from anthropology and science and technology studies when we were looking at the analysis of our findings. And, and one of the things was using those ideas to, to think about how the QPSS functions as a physical object um, of mutual and simultaneous focus, not just its content. And so thinking about it as uh, an actor object. Um, and so it wasn't that in every single instance of use that it functioned in the way that I've been highlighting because in, when it was used independently, it did seem to function primarily as kind of this neutral technology for transferring patient perspectives. But the benefits really came from it being understood as a, an object with agency that, that provides a shared language and infrastructure that uh, not only transferred pre-existing knowledge, but also engendered new relations of care and increased feelings of interconnections. So this relational use appeared to intensify the collaborative capacity of uh, the QPSS. And so I think some of those ideas, uh, as we work further with our data, uh, really will help better inform um, healthcare practice change and policy development. Great. 
Thanks, uh, Marion, for that overview. So this is the last slide, and I'm not going to say too much about it other than um, our purpose was to actually give different perspectives regarding the use of a QPSS and, and to kind of articulate the, the, the tensions surrounding that, uh, both the benefits and the challenges, and to highlight the different types of priorities of macro, meso, and micro levels of, of decision makers, uh, decision making. And so um, uh, we also wanted to highlight kind of awareness of different contextual considerations when implementing uh, PROMs and PREMs in routine clinical practice. It really is a complex intervention. It's not something that you could just come in and tell people to do, but it requires education, training, and support, and uh, uh, both in terms of skill, both in terms of and attitudes uh, and also in terms of knowledge, in terms of how to use uh, these tools and the information they provide. So I'm going to conclude there because I'd like to leave a few uh, moments for questions. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Rick and Marian, or Marian, for sharing your your work today, and it was very informative. And and I think we are running out of time, so we have time for maybe one or two questions and. One of the ones that uh, struck me that has come up from one of our uh, uh, viewers today is, um, are these assessments incorporated in practice at either or both sites since the study? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so um, um, certainly the, um, to some extent. So the, the, the ESAS is a, is a tool, the Edmonton Symptom Assessment Scale is a tool that, that was actually already used in paper form in one of the, the settings and, uh, and is kind of broadly being integrated into palliative care services here. Um, so it so it definitely continues to be used um, in terms of the the online or the electronic system um, that requires a, a another step in turn for integration into um, the existing electronic e-health information systems within the hospitals so what we were testing here was an isolated system and so now there is interest in moving that and integrating that into existing systems but that that's a whole nother process, of course, and that's going to take time. Yeah, I bet it will take some time. Hmm. But interesting, and I, I think there's another question here, and I don't think you addressed it during your uh, uh, session, is those uh, patient cohorts that, that have cognitive impairment, uh, assuming they, is there another technique that has been looked at, or is that just something that hasn't been looked at as yet? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, um, so there's there's two um, two responses to that. One is the potential of using electronic systems to help uh, mitigate for that. And so via electronic systems, uh, one can use kind of visuals quite easily to help um, guide people in terms of interpreting the the response scale formats. And there are several several options for that. Um, so, so that that's a possibility. We haven't engaged that in this particular project um, as of yet. But um, the, but the other consideration has to do with assumptions. Um, in fact, we just completed a survey of people in residential care across the province, um, or of of um, uh, we, and got responses on nearly 10,000 people um, who completed a prom and a prem, and. Um, uh, the results are still being analyzed, but I guess uh, one thing I want to put forward is that that I was quite encouraged to see how people at different levels of cognitive functioning were still able to engage these questions in a meaningful way when they were administered in interview format. So at higher le at lower levels of cognitive function, uh, simply independent use is probably not the most desirable thing. But if it's done in interview format where the interviewer or the clinician can guide people through the questions, you're likely to get more meaningful responses. And we're just uh, about to finish an analysis comparing the responses of people of different levels of, of cognition uh, and doing a validity analysis on that. So stay tuned for that.
Yeah, that would be important. And I know we're kind of running out of time today, and 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 I know your emails are on the screen right now. I, I didn't yep. ask you up front, so I'm putting you on the spot a bit, but um, is it okay if they contact you if there's some follow-up questions on uh, today's webinar? Uh, <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, there, there is also um, there, there's three um, manuscripts currently in reviews on these topics that should hopefully be coming out soon. So you can keep an eye out for that as well for further information. Okay, probably a lot more information in there, and we'll answer most of the questions. So, so that's great, and and thank you both for presenting today. And I just give you one minute here to say to see if you have any final thoughts or uh, before we conclude today's webinar. Um, well, thanks everyone for joining. I, I do hope it was uh, informative and I would very much welcome further discussion. So feel free to contact me and on to you, Marion. Uh, yeah, the same. If anyone uh, has a particular interest in uh, social science theorizing in particular around uh, not just proms and prems, but around issues affecting uh, older adults uh, in clinical settings. Uh, I continue to do that work here in Glasgow. Oh, that's good to know. And I and I and I see there is a lot of comments today so far already and uh, saying thank you for your important presentation and uh, glad to hear um, from both of you. So um, I'm thinking everybody thought this was also a very informative uh, webinar. So you might get some follow up questions. Um, but um, anyhow, I, like I said, thanks again and thanks to everyone for participating today and, and hope that you'll join us on December 2nd for our next webinar. So bye for now and hope you have a great rest of the day.